guys, so welcome back. This is part two of the skin lecture. So before we get into more specific diseases, I want you to remember hypersensitivities. So you're gonna have to think way, way back to week three, I think, of class. Um, and so a lot of skin disorders have an immune component. So we're gonna talk a lot about different hypersensitivities. So in case you forgot, um, type one, two, three, and four, um, I like to remember with, uh, remember your ABCs of hypersensitivities. So type one is allergies. That is also atopic diseases and anaphylaxis. Um, these are um, due to mast cells and IgE. So um, from, I mean, I have bad allergies, so Emmy, that's me. But if, if you don't, um, first of all, I'm jealous. Second of all, um, you might have to think of something else to kind of come up with how to remember type one. Type two is anti body driven, so B. Type three is C, so that is a, a complex, the immune complex. And then type four is a delayed, or it's a, also a delayed type hypersensitivity. The reason why it's delayed is because you have to wake up antigen specific T cells, so that it takes a while to wake them up. So please remember your hypersensitivities. If you have to go back and kind of refresh your memory of what they are, um, please do so um, because uh, we're going to be talking about them a lot in, in this lecture. So first off, um, now we've talked about more general terms of skin disorders. Now we're going to go more focused. Um, your book has group them really nicely into common themes. So I'm going to stick with these themes. We're not going to cover all of them. If you'll notice in your book, there is like, oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, I used to teach most of them. I think I, I feel like I cut out at least half of them um, for this year. Um, but so we're going to still cover a lot. Um, so hopefully just kind of bear with me. I know, I know that these can be can, there, there's, there's just a lot of information. So first we're going to talk about inflammatory disorders. The, and really for the most part, uh, we're going to be discussing uh, dermatitis or eczema. So remember, anytime you see itis um, um, at the end of a word, that's usually refer, referring to inflammation. So um, dermatitis and eczema, um, they are, this is the most common inflammatory skin disorder. Um, these terms, dermatitis and eczema, can be used interchangeably. Um, a lot of times um, we refer to it as, as one or the other. Uh, there are many types of dermatitis that we're going to cover in the next few slides. But for the most part, they tend to present with similar pathologies, such as pruritus. Uh, there are um, usually a rash that has indistinct borders, and there can be changes to the epidermis. So papules, scales, and usually erythema are going to be present. So usually the difference um, for the different um, uh, forms of dermatitis is all about the underlying stimulus that causes that dermatitis. So usually if you remove that stimulus, the resulting pathology will subside. But in some cases of chronic stimulation, it can lead to um, a, a secondary form of uh, pathology, such as uh, lichenification or the development of a thick uh, leathery skin. And the skin may become hyperpigmented as well um, due to that, um, just that constant uh, chronic or recurrent irritation. And then usually the scratching that comes along with um, the, um, with, with the itchiness that is felt um, on these lesions. So in the case of dermatitis um, or eczema, there can be primary and secondary lesions. So primary would be the initial lesions that occur. Um, and then the secondary would be the lichenification, which is due to that excessive itching. So allergic contact dermatitis, um, you know, technically when we say allergic, we're, we're referring to type one hypersensitivities, but um, allergic contact dermatitis is actually a form of T cell mediated um, uh, a hypersensitivity, which is a type four hypersensitivity because it's, it's a delayed um, type response. So what happens is allergen is going to come into contact with the skin 
right here. Um, so this is poison ivy. Um, and uh, so it comes into contact with the skin and it's going to bind with um, uh, what is called a carrier protein um, on the skin. And that forms uh, a, what is called a sensitizing antigen. And so Langerhans cells uh, from the skin, which remember are just essentially skin dendritic cells, will process that antigen and then it will present that antigen to a T cell. And then if that T cell is specific for that, that antigen of the, um, of the, um, well, in this case, the poison ivy plus that skin protein, the carrier protein, then that if that T cell is specific, then it will lead to, um, uh, it, it can lead to um, essentially uh, sensitization. So remember, one thing I want you to really remember is the first time you come into contact, no dermatitis will occur because you have to, you know, you have to find the antigen specific T cell and then clonally expand them. And then um, for the most part, usually by the time that those T cells have kind of uh, clonally expanded and, and done their thing, because remember that can take between up to two weeks, seven to 10 days minimum, um, sometimes up to 14 days. Um, usually by then the, um, the stimulus is gone. So in this case, if you were in contact with poison ivy for the first time, then, um, you know, hopefully you have taken a shower or whatever um, since then, and um, the um, stimulus is gone. The next time you see um, you're exposed to that um, stimulus, such as the poison ivy, those uh, memory T cells are there and they're waiting. And so um, those Langerhans cells will say, hey, is there any memory T cells that remember this? And um, there'll be a T cell that say, yes, I remember. And so then it will go to the site of the contact and then is when you'll, you'll develop that dermatitis. And so these two images right here are of um, uh, poison ivy. So remember, the first time is like a freebie. It may even be, it may not necessarily be your first time. It could be your 10th time because remember these allergies can develop at any time. So at some point, there's going to be one stimulation where there is a development of these antigen specific T cells. And then the next time you see it is when you will start develop and, and every time after that, that you see it, you'll develop that dermatitis. So clinically, this is going to um, have some erythema, swelling, pruritus, and also some of these vesicular lesions as well will occur. And so um, for the most part, um, you know, removal or avoid it, avoidance of the stimulus is the best way to prevent um, allergic contact dermatitis. You can certainly also treat with steroids and other um, kind of anti-itch um, creams as well. But um, once again, remember, we're not going to talk about, we're not going to really test you on treatment. So that is allergic contact dermatitis. The next is irritant contact dermatitis. This is, um, this has nothing to do with, um, uh, uh, allergy. So it's not a it's not technically a type one, two, three, or four hypersensitivity. There is inflammation of the skin, but it's innate immune driven. So um, there's no sensitization needed. Um, it's all about the innate immune system here. So remember the innate immune system is not specific. Um, it's activated um, uh, not in a specific fashion. So you don't need to be sensitized. And so what happens is it's a um, usually a chemical irritation from, uh, from a substance. So um, acids, prolonged exposures to other irritating substances can lead to this um, irritant irritant contact dermatitis. So really anything can lead to this. Um, it just depends. Some um, you know, some individuals are more sensitive to this irritant contact dermatolo dermatitis than others. Um, so, you know, the best thing to do is really to avoid um, contact. So certain soaps, hair dyes, um, detergents, um, you know, you know, a lot of different um, chemicals um, in general can be, um, you know, considered um, irritant uh, or can cause this irritant contact dermatitis. And the clinical manifestations are very similar to that of allergic contact dermatitis. However, just remember that this has nothing to do with antigen specific 
um, T cells. Um, it's not really necessarily even a IgE mast cell mediated thing or antibody driven um, uh, dermatitis. It's all about the innate immune system. The next is stasis dermatitis. So this, um, this generally occurs in people that have poor circulation uh, and is often a sign of venous insufficiency. So it usually occurs in the legs due to venous stasis, uh, edema, vascular trauma. Um, it can occur in one or both of the legs. Uh, the swelling and edema is usually the first sign. Um, but also you're going to have some erythema, pruritus, scaling, petechiae, hyper, hyperpigmentation, and ulceration. So right here, this is a stasis ulcer. So um, I, I would imagine, you can't really tell here, but it probably is um, a little bit swollen. You have the, the erythema, the redness, it, it very likely itches, um, and it's a little bit hyperpigmented as hyperpigmented as well. So what happens is that venous pooling uh, the, the pooling of, of um, leads to um, an accumulation of immune cells, because remember, the immune cells are constantly circulating through the blood. Um, it will also lead to an accumulation of red blood cells, leading to the um, erythema, and then other large molecules as well. So anything really that's in the blood, um, as, it, as that the, the pooling occurs, it all kinds of just builds up in that area. And so that buildup will lead to inflammation and it will lead to obviously edema as well. And so um, that inflammation um, is what kind of contributes to the er erythema um, and the pruritus um, and then also, um, you know, the edema as well um, uh, con contributes to um, uh the uh, well, the edema contributes to the the inflammation because you have that pooling there. So um, this is kind of what a, a stasis, and they they tend to be um, kind of closer to um, the lower part of the leg, kind of close to the ankles, but they certainly can occur. They really can can occur everywhere or anywhere, but the legs, the lower part of the legs, tends to be more common, and the reason for that is really. Uh, gravity. Um, so that's kind of where, as um, you know, uh, when when the pooling occurs, it tends to be kind of in the lower part of the body. Uh, the last form of dermatitis that we're going to talk about now, we're going to talk about atopic dermatitis um, in uh, the end uh, when we talk about kids, um, is um, seborrheic uh, dermatitis. So the cause of this is unknown. It's thought to be due to an overreaction of a specific type of yeast um, that leads to increased epithelial um, proliferation. So epithelial cells in a specific area that are in contact with this yeast may kind of grow at a, an increased rate. So this is a chronic skin inflammation that involves, um, it can occur on the scalp um, and the eyebrows, the eyelids, the nasolabial uh, folds. So, um, you know, if if you um, smile, it, the nasolabial folds are those um, kind of lines that are between your nose and your mouth, uh, the chest, the back. Um, really, it, it just, uh, it seems that it's kind of in usually areas where there is kind of hair or um, uh, or, you know, kind of some moisture. So those like in the, this nose area or oil kind of grease area. Um, so there are certainly periods of remissions and exasperations. Uh, it's like, like I said, it's not really fully understood why this occurs. If it is due to that spe a specific type of yeast, then it could be that it's, it's triggered when that yeast is, is growing at an increased rate. And that may be due to maybe, maybe, um, you know, changes of moisture it could be due to it could be due to a lot of things um, especially because it um, if it lives in your skin maybe maybe periods of stress where you have a little bit of immunosuppression um, it, there's there's a lot of different um, 
ideas. So in infants, this is a cause uh, a cradle cap. If for those of you that have ever seen an infant with cradle cap, um, clinically it'll look as is kind of a greasy and scaly um, um, patches. So and these patches can be either white or yellowish. So you can see on this um, right in this area, they kind of look like they're a little bit white. Um, it may have some uh, redness associated with that as well. Um, and so usually, um, you know, the treatment would be just try to um, keep it clean and um, and um, for a cradle cap, I think you, you can you can actually kind of use a special shampoo and just try to kind of um, use a special comb also to kind of um, to kind of peel it off. So if because if it is due to over, you know, a, a specific yeast trying to remove it would be the best um the best uh, way to kind of treat it. But there are certainly periods of, of remissions and exasperations, and it can be a lifelong um, occurrence. So allergic contact, derm I have a question for you. Allergic contact dermatitis is associated with which of the following? Unmyelinated C nerve fibers, delayed hypersensitivity, venous stasis and edema, or a non immunological non-immunological mediated inflammation. So hopefully you pause this and you kind of try to think it through. And uh, the answer here is that, um, uh, I don't know if I marked it, but it's number two. So allergic contact dermatitis is a delayed hypersensitivity. Um, number one would be that is all about um, pruritus and that itch sensation. Uh, number three would be more associated with stasis dermatitis, and number four would be more of the irritant contact dermatitis. Okay, so now moving on to um, papulosquamous disorders. Papulos, uh, papulosquamous disorders, um, these are going to be characterized by papule scales, plaques, and erythema. So um, once again, remember these images were in, in those first few um, slides, and they also can be found in your textbook. And so populous, uh, papulosquamous disorders include psoriasis um, and pityriasis. Pityeresis rosea and lichen planus. Uh, I think we're really going to focus on the um, psoriasis um, and the um, uh, pityeresis rosea as well. Okay, so psoriasis, this is a chronic relapsing proliferative inflammatory disorder. Uh, it generally affects the skin, the scalp, and the nails. Uh, it can occur at any age, but it usually will manifest by the age of 40. So usually if you do are going to develop psoriasis, it will, you will develop it before the age of 40. It is a T cell mediated disease, but this is not considered a type four hypersensitivity. This is not a, you know, a delayed type reaction in which you are exposed to an antigen and then there's a delay. Um, this is very much a, um, uh, a T cell mediated autoimmune disease. So um, macrophages and dendritic cells are involved, um, CD4 positive T cells. So those are the helper T cells are involved. And um, there's a lot of different cytokines um, that are involved, but two big ones are TNF alpha and interferon gamma. So these are two pro-inflammatory cytokines that very much contribute to the development of these of these plaques. So it manifests by these um, it's a scaly and um, it can be thick and kind of uh, silvery um, lesions. They tend to be elevated and these lesions are usually can be on the scalp, um, the elbows, or the knees, but there are some forms of psoriasis in which it's kind of covers the whole body. Um, not as it like one big lesion is that the lesions are present throughout the body, but they do tend, it does tend to pop, pop up on the scalp, elbows, and knees as well. So psoriasis affects, it's between, it's 
it's hard to kind of estimate sometimes, but the, uh, globally, um, upwards of 11% of the global population. So anywhere between, I think the book said between one and 11% of the global population. It does seem to be more common above the equator. Why this is, is anyone's guess. Um, why it wouldn't be more prevalent below the equator. One um, argument I know for that is maybe it's underreported below the equator. Um, not really sure, um, but it does seem as though more cases tend to be um, reported above the uh, individuals that live above the equator. There are um, likely um, a, a lot of um, genes that are involved in the development of psoriasis. So family history is the biggest indicator of whether or not you will develop psoriasis. So if you have a close relative with psoriasis, I think you're like between 60 and 80 percent likely to develop it as well. Um, so the, the genetics that are thought to be involved in the development of psoriasis or that contribute to psoriasis are um, genes that are involved in skin barrier function and also uh, genes that are involved in immune function. So these genes could include, um, you know, um, uh, uh, keratinocyte uh, uh, growth. Uh, these genes could involve um, immune uh, function, so maybe they're kind of um, hyperactive. There are there's a lot of you know different the genes that are probably involved. So there's a lot of different uh, triggers. Not really sure what exactly you know is kind of the tipping point to to manifest um, psoriasis. So, but there are um, you know those that do have psoriasis. Um, if they experience like a physical injury or infection, certain medications can trigger, um, you know, the development of these, uh, of, of these plaques in these individuals. Diet is also thrown out there. Um, you know, I'm a gut microbiome researcher, so um, I always, I always try to find a way to talk about gut microbes, but there, there are a lot of studies showing that, um, you know, uh, certain diets can affect the severity of psoriasis. Um, so usually uh, processed foods, things of that nature. And whenever I hear about, you know, if diet is related to a disorder, in my my head, I always think, okay, well, maybe it could be um, bacterial related as well. Obviously, the jury's still out on that one. So psoriasis um, in these individuals, what happens is that there is a um, thickening of, of the dermis and the epidermis. So remember those lesions, um, those scaly silvery lesions on the skin are raised and they're, they're, that area is kind of thickened. And the reason for that is because they're, the keratinocytes are they experience hyper proliferation um, so what they what happens is normal epithelial or epidermal turnover is between 26 and 30 days so those cells that are in the epidermis last roughly 26 to 30 days the epithelial or epidermal turnover in uh, um, in these plaques is three to four days so those cells are just growing like it's going out of style essentially they're growing very very fast um, and when they grow really fast um, they don't have time to differentiate differentiate properly so they don't have time to mature they don't have time to um, you know kind of develop into a, a nice mature keratinocyte and so because of this that leads to the scaly plaques um, there's also can be some um, changes to the, the vasculature in these areas as well. And so these are common, remember over here, common locations for psoriasis. So scalp, remember we talked about scalp, elbows, and knees, but also um, can be in um, the armpit, the groin area, fingernails as well can be affected, the trunk, um, and in um, certain areas of the face. Um, but as um, kind of, I think we'll talk about in the next slide, there are certain, there are different forms of psoriasis and some can be kind of more of a, rather than focus in certain areas, it can kind of um, be um, plaques uh, throughout the body.
So you have an increase in epidermal turnover. So these keratinocytes um, grow very fast and they just don't have time to differentiate properly to become a fully functioning uh, skin cell essentially. And so that's what leads to, to the development of these uh, plaques. So there's a lot of different forms of psoriasis. I don't really expect you to memorize these. Um, just is really for you to kind of know that there's, you know, there's, there's multiple forms. So plaque psoriasis is the most common. Um, and that's kind of what we've been discussing in the, in the previous slides. Um, plaque psoriasis itself um, can have varying severity. So it can be mild, it can be moderate, or it can be severe. Inverse uh, psoriasis is pretty rare. Um, it involves um, uh, lesions that are in the skin folds, so the groin and the armpit. Um, and due to that location, um, so being in the groin and the armpit, because these areas tend to be kind of you know, they tend to be more moist and they don't really see a lot of sunlight. So a lot of times they can be misdiagnosed as a fungal infection because the fungus um, likes to grow in areas that are kind of damp and, um, you know, that, that are kind of dark as well. Gutate uh, psoriasis is, uh, tends to be more common in children. So gutate is, there are small papules on the trunk and extremities. So they kind of are are kind of cover the body. Uh, these can be triggered by a respiratory tract infection and can resolve spontaneously. Pustular psoriasis, um, the, um, there's going to be the development of uh, blisters and uh, there will be pus inside of those blisters. So remember pus is just essentially dead neutrophils um, and that the pus that is in the pustular psoriasis will be uh, non-infectious. So there will not be, if you culture that pus, there will be no bacteria in, um, in the, um, in that pus. Um, um, erythrodermic psoriasis, uh, there can, it's a exfoliative, uh, dermatitis that has, um, red scaling lesions that can, um, that tend to be, uh, painful and, um, and very, um, itchy as well. And, and those patients may even experience fever, um, um, uh, fever and, and, and chills as well. And, um, there also can be systemic complications from psoriasis. Um, so psoriatic arthritis is a um, kind of a, a systemic complication of psoriasis. So this is due to um, uh, the inflammation that is associated with psoriasis. So the TNF alpha, interferon gamma, et cetera, can lead to inflammation in nearby joints. And then that nearby joint, those joints then can um, experience um uh, arthritis due to that psoriasis. So, um, the, uh, um, pityriasis, uh, uh, rosea, this is a, um, it's a benign, it's, so it's benign and it's self-limiting, uh, but it is an inflammatory disorder. And so this usually occurs in young adults. Um, and Oddly, it seems to have um, a seasonal prevalence, so it tends to occur in the spring and the fall. Um, it is benign. It usually leads to a rash that lasts between six and eight weeks. Um, while it's mostly benign, um, it can be um, it it can be bad for uh, pregnant women. So it can lead to is it it can lead to an increase in the risk of um, having a miscarriage uh, or um, having premature delivery as well. So it is thought to be associated with a virus. Um, it's not exactly known which virus. There is an idea that it's Ha, um, associated with the, uh, a human, uh, he, one of the human herpes viruses. This is not the same thing as a herpes simplex virus. Um, a human herpes virus is, it's different. Um, so it's not herpes, it's not HSV one or two. It's, um, it's one of the human herpes viruses. Um, so what happens is it begins with this herald patch right here. So a herald patch, um, it can be pretty big. It can be up to four inches in diameter. So it's, it's 
fairly large. Um, and so it's this circular demarcated, it's, it's kind of a salmon pink color. So a few weeks later, after this Herald patch develops, um, there are more lesions can kind of uh, um, uh, occur on the extremities, so the arms and legs and um, the trunk. So the other symptoms that are associated are um, itching, so that the rash um, can experience pruritus, uh, headache, and fatigue are the most common symptoms. So it does really seem to be kind of associated um, with it as an infection. But um, for the most part, outside of, you know, pregnant women or maybe even severely immunocompromised individuals, it is very benign and it is very self-limiting as well. It usually lasts between six to eight weeks for the, at least the rash does. So, um, and it's also a virus, so there's really no, there's no really treatment. You can kind of help, um, you know, manage the rash, but um, the virus, you just kind of have to let it run its course. Acne rosacea. Um, we're going to talk about um, acne vulgaris and, and acne con con congoblata in um, the kids' part, um, but um, acne rosacea. This is um, a skin inflammation of uh, tends to be middle-aged adults, so roughly 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, there are um, four types of lesions that occur in acne rosacea. So, um, uh, I can never say this one. Um, it's, it's essentially the redness, <clears throat> erythema, um, tactic. Um, so the, um, I would, um, uh, highly recommend to go back and look at the, um, uh, telecontasia, uh, lesion. It's kind of like, a you can kind of see like the blood vessels um, and it's, it's red, it's kind of a rash and it seems like you can kind of see like almost the capillaries in, um, in those lesions. But there's also um, papulopustular, um, phymatis and ocular lesions that are associated with, um, with acne rosacea. So it's a lot of times we just call this rosacea, um, but it is a form of acne. Um, so the lesions tend to occur in the middle of the face. So across the cheeks, um, forehead, nose, and the chin area. Um, mostly seems as though um, across the cheek and the nose are the, the more common areas. So um, um, a lot of times like this, this, this redness, uh, very red um, cheeks and um, the nose um, essentially can also, the, the, the inflammation can lead to some fibrosis. So the nose itself can kind of um, take on this bulbous appearance, which is irreversible. So once that bulbous appearance um, of the nose occurs, it can't be um, reversed. But this uh, acne rosacea is it's associated with this chronic um, inappropriate inappropriate vasodilation that results in this flushing of the skin and um, these individuals are very sensitive to the sun so going out in the sun without any kind of um, uh, sunscreen on the face can lead to um, you know maybe in your house your you know your skin wasn't overly red but as you go out in the sun it's very sensitive and so the, the your skin um, your face may get um, uh, very flushed due to um, due to that interaction with the sun. It's not really understood why acne rosacea occurs, um, but we it is likely due to a, a immune response, um, and this immune response um, is um, this redness is due to kind of excessive inflammation in that area. Okay, so I. I want to say this might be the last of the inflammatory lesions and then we'll take a break promise um okay so lupus lupus um uh, erith eth erythematous um erythematosis sorry um this is an inflammatory autoimmune disease it is systemic um and it has cutaneous manifestations so um you know it lupus is an autoimmune disease there are two main types. There is um, uh, skin, which is also called, or skin or cutaneous, or it's also called discoid uh, lupus. Um, and then there's also systemic. So we are going to focus on 
skin or discoid, obviously, because this is a skin lecture. Um, but do keep in mind that um, skin, uh, if lupus uh, initially presents as this cutaneous uh, lupus, it can eventually become uh, systemic. So just keep that in mind. Um, and the and the skin um, obviously will lead to there will be kind of um, a um, I don't want to say systemic, but more of a universal um, affecting of the skin. So um, it's not just going to necessarily affect one area. It can affect multiple areas of the body. So the cutaneous or discoid um, lupus is um, there, once again, can be, um, you know, varying severities. So it can be acute, subacute, or chronic. Um, for cutaneous lupus, it is it is just restricted to the skin. But as I, I had mentioned before, cutaneous lupus can progress to become systemic lupus. So instead of just affecting kind of the surface, the skin area, it can then move to affect other or internal organs of the body. Um, the butterfly rash across the face um, across the nose and the, and the cheeks here. So this would be like the body of the butterfly and the cheeks. This would be like the wings of the butterfly. This is really the hallmark um, kind of um, manifestate, clinical manifestation of lupus. So either the cutaneous form or the systemic form can have this um, can have this butterfly rash. Um, certainly other conditions we just talked, you know, saw in the rosacea, right? The, um, the cheeks and the nose are often um, um, will experience a rash that could also mimic a butterfly rash. Um, um, so other conditions can lead to a rash across the face, but lupus really, um, um, a lot of times if, you know, a person has kind of a lot of um, kind of generalized symptoms and they see this butterfly rash, they may do a test for lupus just because um, because it is so common for for individuals with lupus to have this butterfly rash. Um, doesn't mean you have lupus, um, but um, a lot of times just, you know, trying to catch it early to rule it out is is usually is usually the goal. So this, like I said, cutaneous lupus can lead to the development of systemic uh, lupus. Um, but um, as I said, we're just focusing on um, skin. So there are other lesions as well in other areas of the body um, outside of the face um, with cutaneous lupus. So lupus is an autoimmune disease. It's all about, um, it's so and don't get mad at me. So it's autoimmune disease, but it's also technically a hypersensitivity as well. So um, uh, uh, with an individuals with lupus, there is an altered immune response. There is a development of self-reactive T cells and self-reactive B cells. So those self-reactive B cells are going to produce antibodies that are um, specific for an antigen that is a self-antigen. Um, there's also going to be a decreased number of regulatory T cells, and there's going to be an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so the tissue damage that um, occurs in um, lupus or um, in, in the, um, you know, the um, pathological features of lupus are due to um, these ano um, autoantibodies, so uh, self-antigen specific antibodies and immune complexes. So um, the, remember we talking about type three um, immune response, right? You have your um, antigens bound to um, antibody, these immune complexes, and they get stuck in these blood vessels. And so when they get stuck in these blood vessels, uh, innate immune cells will come and try to clear them and they're gonna create or produce enzymes and inflammation to try to clear them. But if they're stuck in a blood vessel that's near the skin surface, then um, that's going to lead to those that um, those rashes and those plaques that are going to development. So um, because of the uh, immune complexes that are formed, which type of hypersensitivity would um, lupus be? Type one, two, three, or four? So pause it. Think about that really quick. Um, so um, systemic forms um, of lupus are generally classified as type three um, because of these immune complexes, right? Um, so type three is an immune complex, um, but technically the cutaneous form is 
a mix of both type two and type three. So there are some just single antibody um, bound to antigen that will lead to um, uh, disease manifestations. Whereas, um, so there's a mix of both for cutaneous essentially. So cutaneous is technically a t both a type two and type three hypersensitivity. But there's no delay. It's not a type 4 and it's not a uh, type 1. So cutaneous would be type 2 and type 3 combined. But right here pictured is type 3. Okay, so a question for you um, as we move on to the next section. We'll, we'll take a break first. Which information is correct regarding acne rosacea? So it, does it occur most commonly during adolescence? Is it primarily found on the lateral portions of the forehead? exhibits a single lesion called a herald patch, or is it likely an immune-mediated inflammation? So hopefully you paused and thought through. The answer is number four. It's likely an immune-mediated um, inflammation. Remember that um, there is um, uh, a lot thought to be a vasodilation um, that occurs um, in response to um, one sensitivity is, is greatly due to the sun. We don't really know, but it's probably um, immune mediated. So um, number one, we haven't gone over it yet, but that would be acne vulgaris. Um, acne rosacea tends to develop in middle-aged um, adults. Number two would be, um, it's not really on the lateral portions of the forehead. It's usually more so on the forehead, nose, cheeks, and chin. And number three would be um, um, the pityarius rosea would be, um, uh, causes the herald patch. So please take a break. And then we're going to move on to vesiculobolus disorders.